last time we were talking about accessibility and um, we left off and I want to kind of rewind for a minute before we continue where we left off. Um, and I want to point to um, some reasons for the importance of accessibility. It's easy to think that accessibility relates just to people <coughs> that are blind because the web is such a vi visual media, but that's not the case. So a few things to keep in mind about accessibility is there's any number of conditions that affect a person's ability to access some content on the web. All right. In addition to those conditions, there are sometimes temporary conditions or milder versions of those conditions, which also can be relevant. The example, of course, of someone who may not necessarily be blind, but simply has poor vision. Someone who may not be deaf, but they're working in a lab where there are no speakers on the machines to keep from there being noise. All right? Um, that's really not a disability, but again, for practical purposes, it's as though a person that's deaf is accessing that page. They can't hear any of the content <coughs> in, in our labs, for example, unless you bring your own headphones. Um, so there's milder versions of many disabilities or temporary versions. Um, many of the things we do for accessibility also helps people that do not have those disabilities. <coughs> So, for example, to be able to customize the colors of a web page. Well, for some people that's an accessibility issue. By being able to customize the colors, uh, they're able to read the content better. Uh, for people that don't have that disability, yeah, it's a nice feature to be able to customize it and make the page look the way that you want it to. So, there's a benefit for people like that. Uh, you may not be deaf for example, but you might want to read a transcript of a video instead of listen to the entire video. That's oftentimes the case with me. Um, I can read pretty quick, I can scan through, so rather than having to listen to the video, I'd rather read through, scan through the news story. So if there's a transcript of the video, um, that benefits me even though I'm not deaf. Um, so all these issues taken together mean that the issues we talk about for accessibility really, um, in some respects, are simply good web design. And they're designed that benefits um, everyone in, in a, uh, accessing a website, and not just people with uh, a given disability. How do we do accessibility? Um, again, the two key principles for accessibility <coughs> are to have multiple presentations. In other words, take the same content and show it a couple different ways. All right? The second principle might seem contradictory, contradictory to that, and that is simplicity, keeping the web page simple. All right? Well, how are you going to be simple and show the same content a couple different ways? Well, that's sort of the art and skill of a designer to be able to do that, to be able to put together a page that contains <coughs> different things and contains the same content showed a couple different ways, but still keep it simple and, and not overkill. So let's look at the examples that we had of different disabilities that affect people's ability to access the web. And let's talk about um, some of the th measures that we can take as web designers to, um, to uh, uh, assist that. <coughs> so we had up on the board last time. related issues, which can range from blindness or simply poor eyesight 
or colorblindness. Um, I'll try to put them in some kind of order because we were just identifying them um, before. Deafness, or I'll write it as a hearing issue, which can range from full-blown deafness to simply poor hearing. A great example of accessibility thing that can help people uh, even if they don't have the disability is I a lot of times when I watch Netflix or Hulu I turn the closed captioning on just in case I miss something just in case like someone mumbles something on screen and I can't really hear it. Uh, I find that beneficial. So it's not that I'm deaf, it's that well maybe my hearing isn't what it used to be and something like that can help. <coughs> um, other things, there's mobility issues. Um, which can range from, you know, uh, extreme, um, such as paralysis, to things like arthritis, carpal tunnel, uh, people that have, um, um, what would you say, um, that, that whose hands shake and, and things like that, I guess, could be classified as a mobility issue or a neurological issue. Um, there are different sort of cognitive related issues related to understanding the content, and that includes something like ADHD. Epilepsy is not really a cognitive issue. Dyslexia. Uh, neurological issues, something like Parkinson's, which affect the motion and uh, the hands tremoring. Um, epilepsy, which means seizures, can be triggered. Let's see if we're missing anything else. I have ADHD. Yes, I do. Cognitive, deaf, epilepsy, neurological, dyslexia. Yeah, I think, I think most of these are the ones that are relevant. And the one thing we identified, too, is age-related conditions, which could consist of bits of all these, right? Uh, People older than a certain age are going to have some arthritis in their hands, like more than likely. They're going to have some problems with their vision, some problems with their hearing, and so on down the line. So, what can we do to address these things? Remember, our two, the two main tools that we're going to use is we're going to try to keep things simple. And we are going to present things multiple ways. Let's go down the list and let's talk about some of these. And I'll give examples. We'll start off with vision. So one of the ways that we talked about with vision that accessibility can be achieved is for people that are blind, you can do things like make sure you have all attributes on all your images. Because if you have an all attribute, that will be read <coughs> to the user instead of, uh, instead of just telling them that there's an image there. Um, it won't necessarily, you know, be as good as seeing the image, but there's really nothing you can do. And if that image happens to be a link somewhere, you, it'll be told, you know, you can tell them that, hey, the logo is a link to the home page, for example. One thing that's often done with vision, uh, with, uh, with, uh, for accessibility reasons for blind people, is you have a skip to navigation link, all right? If you can imagine, um, or skip navigation link. If you can imagine, if you don't want the navigation on a page, if you want to read the content of the page, the screen reader will read starting at the top of the page going down. 
Well, many websites have the exact same content uh, on every page on the top, the header, that contains a navigation. That means every time you load a page, it's going to read you that navigation. Well, sometimes you want to just skip over that navigation and get to the, get to the meat of the page. Well, someone who can see, they do that almost without thinking, right? They will, their eyes will simply skip over the navigation and start reading content. So if the page would look like this, and there's link, 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 and here's the content. You know, your eyes, if you're not interested in the navigation, your eyes are just going to skip over that and you'll start reading the content. Well, someone accessing it with the screen reader, the screen reader is going to read all those links in order. And there's no easy way to skip it unless you provide them a link. So what do you do? You actually can provide an invisible link. So you'd put something like a link to content. Skip navigation. And then have an ID on this paragraph or whatever that says the ID of it is content. So when you get to this page, the first thing it reads is skip the content. So if you want to skip over the navigation, you just take that link and jump over it and get to the content area of the page, and we'll read that. It's a very common thing. If you listen real closely when we use the screen reader to view LC's page, there was a skip to content link right off the bat. Now, how do you make this so that this doesn't get in the way of a uh, person that can see? You make it invisible. So the link is there in the HTML, but you set the, the visibility to hidden so that people that can see don't see it because it might be confusing to them. What does that mean, skip the content? Wouldn't cause any problems if they happen to click it, but it might be confusing. So you can make it invisible. All right? So that's another thing that you can do for people that is blind beyond just having an alt attribute. Poor eyesight and color blindness. Customization helps. Customization is a form of multiple presentations, right? You can choose to have the page to be uh, white with uh, black text or yellow with blue text or uh, whatever, pick your favorite color combination, all right? Uh, by giving people choices, they're able to see, uh, uh, they're able to pick the, the thing that works best for their particular eyesight. Being able to size the pages uh, and being able to uh, choose a larger font. Now, one thing, they put Zoom capability in most browsers, so that's something that the web designer really doesn't need to worry about too much these days because you can always Zoom the page if you want to. But some old pages would have the ability for you to say how, you know, how big you want the fonts to be so that a person could pick it bigger or smaller depending on their eyesight. Uh, it might be that different fonts are easier for people with color blindness or with certain vision issues to read. So that could also be part of the customization where you pick that. Now, we're learning about half of what you need to learn to be able to customize your page. And we might talk about the other half when we get to JavaScript. Because we are already have talked about using, taking the same HTML page and developing different versions of it to display with different CSS files. We did that on one or two of the assignments. We did that in the, in the case of a mobile web page and so on. So we're already familiar with taking the same content and displaying it different ways. The only thing we would have to do to complete this would be to write the code in JavaScript to allow the user to select their uh, style sheet that they want to use. And it's not really that hard, all right? Um, you can find examples on the web. That's something, if you want to try and experiment on your own, Google it. Google JavaScript style sheet switcher, all right? 
and you'll see how you can take and switch the style sheet of a given page to allow the people to customize the page. All right. And again, there's a big accessibility benefit for people that are colorblind or have poor vision. But you know it also benefits other people as well because it may not be as critical, but it's nice to have the color scheme that you want, even if you're not colorblind or have poor vision. Another thing as far as color blindness goes, and this is it's a little hard to, uh, to, to word, but I'll, I'll try my best to word it, is to don't exclusively use color to indicate the meaning of something. Let me give you an example of that. Let's say you have a page and you know, the classic one, uh, the classic example I give is like a page for uh, a prescription drug company. All right. They always have warnings on, on, on medication. You know, it could cause this side effect or that side effect. Don't drink when you're taking this medication or what, or don't drive when you're taking this medication or whatever. All right. That might be text that you'd want to stand out on the web page. All right. Because it's important. It's a warning. All right. Now, typically, at least in our society, when we want a warning to stand out, what would we do? We might make it red, right? Red typically is like, hey, this is an alert. Something's wrong. But what if you don't have, what if, you, what if you're not able to distinguish between red and uh, the, the color red, and it just looks like a, just looks like a blur or, or, or a gray blur sort of, all right? What could you do to emphasize it in a different way? Yes? Put a background around it with a frame. And Put a border around it? Or just a different colored field with different colored characters on it. Okay. You could, you, could, you could have a different color background and a different color foreground for it. Different color text and different color background. You could put a border around it. What's another way? You could bold the text. Could make a bold. Another way, italics, bigger, different font. You got dozens of possibilities of how you could do it. <coughs> yes? I got a friend who's color deficient. Like, he can't tell the difference between, like, he's not full blown color, blue, right. but he can't tell the difference between, like, red and green. Right. So, like, he's always told me that the best thing for him was to have, like, colors that are able to, like, be highly distinguished. Um, right. Like, opposite sides of the spectrum, like, like a blue okay. and yellow. Okay. The, the, the issue with that is there's a whole bunch of different color blindness, and the blue and yellow would be good for him, mm -hmm. but it, that may be the color combination that causes other people I, problems. I also, I'm, like, I'm part, part of me, because I know I'm late, and you might have said this already, All right. but, like, for different things like that, don't they have, like, I, I know I remember you bring it up on LC's website, but can't, don't they have more than one, like, palette for, like, <laughs> on certain websites where you can change the colors? But yeah, you yeah, exactly. The ability to customize it. So yeah, what you could do is you could pick good, co good contrasting colors and let someone customize it. Right, would, would be another thing you can do. Um, I'm just, we're just trying to go through a list of techniques that, that you can supply. And customizing is, is one example of something that you could do to, to sort of increase it. But the other thing, if there's something that you really want to have stand out, like a warning message or something, you can still put it in red, right? But do something else too. Make it in red and italics. Red with a border on it. Red with a bigger font. Red and bold. All right? All those things, that's just a second way to emphasize it. So people that are colorblind that can't tell red, for example, they don't see that it's red text, but they see it's bolded. And that's enough to say, oh, okay, this must be something different about this. This must be something important. Or a border around it, or italics. Now, people that can see red, well, they get two signals that it's special content. They see it's red and then they see it's bold. All right? So don't use things in addition to color to indicate that something is special. This, again, gets back to the whole idea of design, right? Um, we don't simply use colors to um, make our pages look nice. You know, we don't just randomly make every paragraph different colors. 
all right? We try to use colors in a meaningful way. So if we make something a different color, that's naturally going to emphasize that. If you sort of overkill with the colors and have everything a different color, then nothing is emphasized, right? You can't really, nothing stands out because everything is different. Whereas if you have a consistent look and just highlight a couple of things, then those things really stand out. And again, all I'm suggesting is absolutely do that. That's good web design. But to accommodate people that are colorblind, use something in addition to color to indicate that something is special. All right, what can we do for people that are deaf or have poor hearing? Oh, by the way, look, just to back up for a second, all those examples I gave were except for vision were examples of multiple presentation, right? We show the same thing in two different ways. So with color blindness, we show it with the color and we show it by making it bold. We give the ability to customize it so you can present the information one way or another way. What about hearing? What do we can do for people that are deaf or hard of hearing or in a lab where there are no speakers? Transcript. Transcript. Would be, would be one, all right? Again, multiple presentations. You have a video or an audio file, and you have a transcript from it, all right? Um, <coughs> that's gonna benefit someone that can't hear, right? Because someone that can't hear can go and read the transcript instead. They can watch the video and read along with them. Uh, especially if they're good lip reading, they can keep up and, and find exactly uh, where it is, or they can sort of watch the video and, and, and read along with it um, if they want. <coughs> Again, that's going to benefit people that are hard of hearing. Like I said, I turn captions on Netflix even though I'm not deaf. Why? Because sometimes I can't hear what they say, and, and by having the captions on it, okay, I can see it. It'll help people that even don't have any issues with their hearing, but they don't know if they want to spend 15 minutes listening to this news story, that they might just want to scan through the article uh, and read quickly and then decide if they want to watch it. All right? In addition to transcripts, what's another technique that you can use uh, in addition to, besides a transcript? I've already sort of said it. Captioning, right? Uh, the difference between captioning and a transcript is a transcript would just be like a paper that would show you everything that's said, where the transcript, like one line at a time, would appear on the bottom of the screen. All right? The unfortunate thing is uh, most of those things require people to do them, all right, to prepare a transcript and uh, to uh, prepare captions. Have any of you ever tried listening to YouTube videos and turn on the captioning? Yeah. Yeah. Doesn't work very well, does it? Some of my students in, in all my other classes do that just for amusement, just to see what it says that I say, you know, because it doesn't get me, doesn't get what I say correct <coughs> very often. That's very difficult. I wanted, uh, in addition, I wanted a transcript of an audio file I had, and I did some research. They're really isn't great software that's inexpensive that does it. You're best off hiring someone to translate it. You not not translate it really, but transcribe it and, and take it and write it. Yes? Could you like pictures to like demonstration Yeah, you could. Uh, again, you could you could present it a different way. So for example, if I was showing you how to make an omelet. I could say, and you see a lot of these like videos on Facebook that do this, and I don't think they do it necessarily because of accessibility, but it is nice. They might say, take two eggs, and they show someone holding two eggs, and they might even have the words, two eggs, across the screen. You know, crack them and put them in a bowl, you know, and then use a fork to, to whip them up. And they might have some of the words up on the screen as you're saying it. So that's a way of, again, presenting the same information visually, audially, and with the text of the words. So something along those lines, you know, can be very effective um, for that, where you have the images and the pictures. Again, it's just a different form of multiple presentation. What about 
mobility. What can you do for people that um, have trouble moving? Uh, very famous person that falls into this category um, was Stephen Hawking, who just passed away. Right? He actually used uh, his mouth to use a, to move a pointer. Uh, that allowed him to speak and, and do things. So that was a case of assistive technology uh, doing the trick. Um, so there are some pieces of assistive technology that can help people with mobility. One of them I mentioned was the on-screen keyboard. Sometimes it's easier for people not to type but to use the on-screen keyboard. All right. Uh, there can be there can be the uh, track pads instead of the mouse if that's easier for you to uh, to, to move around and so on. What are things that you, and so that's an example of, of the assistive technology, which also comes into play. What are things that you can do in your program to help people that have issues with mobility? <coughs> yes. Like a voice to text kind of thing. Um, that would that would fall more into assistive technology, but that's a possibility. Sure, you know. Um. um you know, something like Google Assistant would be great for someone that, that has that. You know, um, one of my friends that, that has some mobility issues uses Google Assistant a lot. It's not that they can't do it, it's just inconvenient. Yeah, and it's just much easier to, to speak into it. Yes? Well, I don't know if this answers your question, but is there a way for people with memory issues to have assistance as well? <coughs> There are some things that we can do, all right? One thing we can do, and it may not seem like a big deal, but you can indicate um, if you visited a link before or not, all right, which could be useful. That's like the first thing that comes off in my head, is, is you can use like a different color, a different designation to indicate that. That could help someone that, that might not remember, gee, did I already go to that page or not, all right? So that would be one thing I can do. Um, other things, um, I would say make a pay, make each page look consistent and have a consistent name for your pages. Have your each page have a consistent layout and so on. That really helps everyone in sort of remembering <coughs> how your site is set up and being able to navigate around it. So those would be a few things that I could do. Um, the other thing I would say as far as mobility goes is to have, um, have make sure your, the, the targets to link on are tiny, all right? Make sure that the, the areas that you can link, uh, that, that you can link to aren't little tiny areas on the screen, all right? Make sure there's, there, there's, that the, the, uh, the links are big enough for someone to, they don't have to like, it's not like a video game where you have to get your mouse exactly on a dot to access a link. Another thing that you can do is keyboard shortcuts. All right, These are all forms of multiple presentation. You can click on the link or you can use a keyboard shortcut. Um, let me Google real quick. how you can do a keyboard shortcut. I really like the tab thing where you can just hit tab and it brings it. Tab to through, right, right. That's like a default behavior of the browser. So that is, that's really cool. Here's an example of creating a link with that. Access key equals C. This one access key equals H. 
So, alright. <coughs> Alt and access key on Windows. Alt Shift uh, for IE, Safari, and, and that. Uh, Firefox is Alt and Shift. So nothing up my sleeve. I'm not touching the mouse. Put the mouse way over here. I'm going to do all H, <coughs> and absolutely nothing happened. Let's make sure we have that <coughs> selected. All H. I tabbed it. I tabbed it. You can always tab and like hit space. Oops. And hit space or enter. And that will select it. Maybe. Maybe. All access key. So all. All right, I give up. Um, so this does not seem to be accurate, but there is a way to do it. Let's see, keyboard shark. one. I don't know why the other one wasn't right. Here I'm on there. Again, now nothing up, uh, up my sleeve. I hit Alt-M and it's going to click on that link. And we can go to it. So that's very useful. Um, again, this is a case of it's useful for people to have that disability, for some people to have that disability, uh, to be able to use keyboard shortcuts instead of that. But you know what? There's a lot of like power users that love to use keyboard shortcuts for like everything. So if you give them the opportunity to do that, people that are like can type real fast, for example, um, they like to keep their hands on the keyboard. So if you can give them a keyboard shortcut, that will work great for them. All right. I don't know any keyboard shortcuts ever. All right, because I'm not a good typist and. I'm more than happy to use the mouse to, to navigate the things. But for people that, that are proficient typists, keyboard shortcuts are help. Parkinson's with the tremoring would fit in sort of the same thing. That, that's in a way, the cause of it are neurological, but affects the mobility. So uh, that would be one thing. Uh, cognitive issues, things like ADHD, dyslexia, and epilepsy, and, which is a neurological issue. What are things that you can do to help someone with ADHD on your site? Yes. Keep it simple. Keep it simple. All right. When you say keep it simple, what does that mean to you? Not a lot of like color, like uh, very varying like color scheme almost. Okay. All right. Okay. A lot of animations and all that. Anyone want to add to that? Just what you need is in front of your face. Just what you need. Right. Now, again, how many people want extra stuff on their page distracting them? No one does. Right? So we could talk about this as an accessibility issue, that for people with ADHD, we want to keep the page simple. We want to only have the stuff on there that we need. We don't want to have animations going on or a lot of colors that don't really mean anything and so forth. All right? That's describing just a well-designed web page. All right? So whatever reason you do it for, you gain the benefit of that actually helps people with ADHD. And it helps everyone else as well. All right? When you do something, you do it purposefully. All right? Don't simply have different colors on your page to have different colors. Have different colors because they indicate something to the user. They mean something. Do it with intent. 
Does this mean never have animations? Of course not. If there's something uh, about your page that you're explaining how something happens, if you're explaining cell mitosis or what, whatever that is, I don't know, but if you're explaining that, it might be useful to have an animation. All right, to show exactly how that works and how this cell does this and that and so on, and boom, you end up with two cells. All right, that might be useful to have an animation. But don't simply have an animation of uh, a frog riding a unicycle just because it looks cute, all right, on your page, because that's distracting for people, all right? So do things purposefully, all right? <coughs> um, when I talk about keeping things simple and doing it for accessibility, that doesn't mean um, oversimplifying. I'll uh, use a phrase that I really don't like, but I'll use it anyhow because people kind of know what it means. It doesn't mean dumbing down your site, all right, by making it boring and getting rid of interesting content like videos or animations or whatever. What it means is do things that really have a purpose. Don't do things just because, oh, you think they're neat, you think they're cool, whatever. Because if they're not adding to the page, they're distracting from the page. There's not a benefit for having that content, then it's actually uh, a disadvantage to have that content because it distracts people away from that. Um, we talked a little bit about epilepsy last time, uh, about what you could do is you could, again, show the animation a couple different ways, right? If you know that some people are bothered by certain kinds of animations and you absolutely have to have that animation on your site because it's valuable content, Give them an alternative. Say, you can either view this animation or click on this page and we'll have a photo gallery that is animated but might show the same process. So if you're concerned about animation, um, that's something you could do. Again, different presentations. Take the same content and show it different way. The art of design is to be able to do that without cluttering your pages or making it too complicated. Dyslexia is, a, uh, is an interesting one. Uh, what does dyslexia mean? What, how would you define dyslexia? Go ahead. Mixing up letters. Mixing up letters. All right. Do people that have it mix up every single letter? No. Is it, a, a lot of people think that it's like they flip letters around. Or like, see things backwards. See things backwards. Is it that? Maybe sometimes, but not all the time. Uh, there's actually a dyslexia simulator <coughs> that's really interesting. I'm going to find it first, and then I'll turn on the screen. some good definition and overview. Dyslexia is a brain-based language fluency disorder. A D might be confused for a B. There might be some word reversing, tip and pip. You might flip letters, M's and W's. Might transpose letters, so not flip the whole word, but just flip some letters, felt and left may confuse small words, all right? Here is uh, some more stuff. Let's get to the simulation. That's how may someone might read, might see something. Let's try to read it. 
maybe a text only site be ideal for someone with a reading disorder? Hardly. Images are not bad for accessibility. They actually increase comprehension and I don't know what that is. For worst. That's uh, comprehension, I think, Mike. That, okay. Uh, yeah. Comprehension for worst audiences. Most audiences. What many people do not know, though, is there is much more at the access to the accessibility for an image than just its alt text. Some people wrongly assume that images are bad for accessibility. Okay. So, you know, the thing is, is we could read it. All right. I've done this simulation before, so I probably maybe did better than, than people viewing it for the first time would, right? But still, I didn't read it anywhere as fast as I could read it. Could you imagine re having to read everything that way? All right? That'd be very, very, very difficult. So, here's questions from that. Why are images good for web accessibility? They provide a alternative to where... All right. Those with like dyslexia or something like that can uh, they can get your message while okay. uh, not having to. All right. Who would negative negatively be impacted by a text only site? Well, people with dyslexia. Here's the unmodified paragraph. <coughs> would a text only site be ideal for someone? With a reading disorder, hardly. Images are not bad for accessibility. They actually increase comprehension and usability for most audiences. What most people don't know, though, is there's much more to the accessibility of an image than its alt text. Some people wrongly assume that images are bad for accessibility, since alt text it essentially replaces the image with the text only <coughs> version of that image. Here are some of the things that, that they suggest doing. Number one, using consistent navigational schemes. Bowman suggests that complex layouts or inconsistent navigational schemes may confuse individuals with cognitive disabilities. Keep navigational schemes as consistent as possible. So they're suggesting that for people that have cognitive disabilities such as dyslexia and other things. <coughs> Who else benefits from a consistent navigation scheme? Everybody. Everyone on the planet Earth, right? I mean, you, that's one of the things that we talked about when we talked about good web design is consistency. So there's a, there's a great book on web design called Don't Make Me Think. The idea is to build web pages that people look at and they know how to use it and after they've been on it a while they don't have to guess where the navigation is. They don't have to guess where the search bar is because it's always in the same place. So you can do this. Imagine if you had trouble reading these words but you got to know that gee the first one is home the second one is news so if you had trouble reading it you would just get to know based on <coughs> position that that second one is news. Organize information in manageable chunks. Again, sounds like a good basic web design <coughs> principle. Give your content a context. So, in addition to having written things, have a picture that goes with it. That can help put the text in the context. All right, so if someone's reading something, and they see a picture of something next to it that helps someone from with dyslexia decipher maybe some of the text. <coughs> Allow users to control the text size, color, and background contrast. In addition, I would argue the fonts as well. Because there might be 
one font or another that's more uh, easy for people with dyslexia to read. In addition, using space between stuff. Well, that's kind of what they said about putting things in manageable chunks. And then there's additional resources. Let's quickly look up if there's a font that's best for dyslexia. Because I've seen different research on this. Most recommendations come from association. They agree using sans serif fonts. Ariel, Comic Sans, believe it or not, as an alternative to these, Verdana, Tahoma, Century Gothic, and Trebuchet. There's actually a special font that was created for people with dyslexia. I'm not sure what the research is to support this, but the claim is that this font assists people with dyslexia in, in reading it. I think it's got to do with like the letters being kind of um, like just not straight. Like right. a B might be curved <coughs> than a B or like... Right. And, and they're sort of asymmetrical. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think those are some of the characteristics um, of that that, that uh, uh, go for it. But again, customization, you know. Um, if you let people choose between options, you know, they'll do their best to pick a, a combination of, of attributes that works best for them. I do want a, a reminder that um, this Thursday, I think it is, the design for your project is due. So um, we will spend at least some time on Thursday. I will spend at least some time on Thursday answering your questions. And again, feel free to ask me questions uh, in lab. All right, I'm going to go. I'm going to uh, go unlock the lab. I'm going to come back here to grab the video files. And then I'll be back.